uh, the bell is ringing, so I think that means it's time for us to start. I, <laughs> I don't like to break up people's uh, lovely conversations. Um, Nathan Patrick is my name, and if you are new or visiting here this morning, I want to extend a very warm welcome to you. And in case I forget, after the service, we gather around for some bites to eat and uh, tea, coffee, hot chocolate, that sort of thing. So you're very welcome. In fact, you're invited to join us after the service and we can get to know each other more. Just some announcements before we begin. Um, Kim Jager, anyone who's a regular here would know our brother Kim. Kim uh, is a missionary in the rural and remote areas of Tasmania. And he uh, goes and uh, speaks to and spends time with and helps and counsels and conducts worship with people who are on farms and in towns that are a long way from city centres. Uh, and we always remember Kim, of course, in our prayers, and we'll do that later this morning. Uh, Kim has sent a thank you message to us as a congregation for the donation that we made to him recently. Um, and he wants everyone to know that he finds that particularly encouraging that we are identifying with him in the work. Another piece of news that has a missional bent is uh, you may remember on Good Friday at a service then, we uh, had a special collection for the Kamastaya Church in Vanuatu. Um, I think most people here would know Amos and Ian, uh, from, men from Vanuatu, who faithfully attend here at worship and my Monday night Bible study as well. Um, when they're able to, they're, they're pickers uh, and planters, so their uh, rosters don't always allow them to be here. But um, I'm very uh, thankful to report that uh, of the $2,200 that was required to fix the roof at their church in Vanuatu, uh, we managed to exceed that as a congregation and we got $2,502. And so hopefully that's not only going to give them a roof, but maybe it'll provide something extra for maintenance as well. So that's a cause to be very thankful. Yes. Thank you. Pres aid, and that's connected with it. No. Thank you. In that case, scrap all the dollar talk I just had. We made enough, and it's going to give them a roof. Thank you. Good. Excellent. Thank you, Nari. Uh, this is why I'm not on the Committee of Management. <laughs> you don't trust me with money matters. <laughs> yes. All right. Um, excellent. Um, Yes. Now, having said that, um, we're going to come before the Lord in a, our time of worship now. Um, our minister, of course, Michael, is away on his annual leave. He's uh, surprising the brothers and sisters at Scottsdale Church this morning by sitting in their pews. But Michael and Wendy and Josh are away. We've got Sam with us, Flo. Uh, uh, but uh, on the 5th of, of May, uh, Michael's due to return to be here in the pulpit again. Um, our call to worship uh, is very relevant to our sermon this morning, and it's from the last verses of Psalm 139, which say, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Let's come to God in prayer. Our loving Father in heaven, we do indeed call upon you now to search our hearts. And Lord, we know that your holy and perfect and infallible word does search our hearts and it does find us lacking. It finds us wanting. It finds us in error and it finds us to be stamped with sin. Lord, we thank you that you are a loving God. We thank you that you are a merciful God and we thank you that you are a just God and that your justice was satisfied in the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ, coming and taking the sins of us, of all your people, upon himself, that he died the death that was due to us, that his blood was shed instead of ours, his body broken. Lord, we thank you that he did this so that we may be atoned, we have atonement with a holy God in heaven. Lord, it's in his name that we come before you this morning. Lord, asking that you forgive our sins, craving, Lord, the assistance, the work, the power of the Holy Spirit this morning in all that is said and done. We ask, Lord, that your people may be encouraged, 
that those who do not know you yet would meet with you this morning as Christ is presented in his word in, in, in this worship. And we ask, Lord, that your name may be honoured and glorified in this place today. And we pray this in our Saviour's name. Amen. Well, friends, we're going to have our first song, which is How Great. Thanks, team.
it is the time in our worship where our tithes and offerings are received. Now, uh, in the welcome that I gave to new people and visitors, that also means that please let the bag pass you by. Okay, this is for our regular people. Thank you. It's uh, now time for us to uh, pray for a number of things that touch our lives here as Christians together and specifically for our congregation and certainly for uh, some missionary uh, endeavours that we are involved with and support. Um, Michael's newsletter uh, that he sent, I think, on Wednesday this week um, had a report from the Rojas family, RJ and Haley and their lovely children, uh, I think most of us here would know that uh, they have uh, intentions um, that are prayerfully uh, put together to go to a certain region in Cambodia to be Bible translators. And they made their first foray into that country uh, and just recently came back. And they have some very exciting news about their welcome there and about the way it seems that the Lord is opening up the opportunities for them. So I encourage you, if you receive Michael's email, to read the report from RJ and Haley. Uh, certainly people very close to our hearts. Um, so we're going to pray now, of course. Uh, if you've seen the news last night and this morning, you'll know that there was a terrible violent attack in a shopping mall in Sydney yesterday. And I'm sorry to report that a sixth person has now died. Um, and we'll be praying for the situation and the, um, the people who are in hospital right now. So let's come and pray together. Our Lord, we thank you for what's just been received in the collection. And Lord, we thank you for your generous hand, which we see all about us all the time. And Father, we with great joy now dedicate what has been received to your service. And we pray that it would be used effectively uh, for that end, for the proclamation of the word in this place and throughout the world and to support uh, those in need and to support the uh, activities of our congregation here. Father, our minds do go to what's in the news and we pray for the situation with the uh, multiple murders that occurred in Sydney yesterday. Lord, we uh, pray for those who grieve now we pray for those who are traumatised and shocked. Lord, we ask uh, for uh, the situation with each person who would be so dreadfully affected. Lord, that you would reach out with your hand of mercy and give them hope. And Lord, we pray that you would bring Christians into the fore to comfort those who grieve. And we ask, Lord, that your wonderful message of love and of certain hope would come to the people who are so affected. For those who are in hospital injured, we pray for healing for each one, uh, from the very youngest, Lord, uh, all through the lifespan, those who have been struck by this fellow. We ask, Father, that you would bring rapid and complete healing, and that uh, people uh, would know that you are working to heal the situation. Lord, we pray for uh, our own society in general where some of us feel that these attacks which some time ago were so shocking are almost daily. And Lord, we know that our society has forgotten you. Lord, we know that we have uh, people 
seemingly with the loudest voices, who deny your very existence and certainly have a hatred for you and for what you have taught us. And we ask, Lord, that you would send a great revival upon this land to change that. We ask, Lord, that your message of hope would go forth from pulpits throughout this land, no longer watered down, but that the people of Australia would know that there is no other way forward, that there is no other hope in life or death than the Lord Jesus Christ and his power to save. We ask, Lord, that people would come obediently to you and come to your law, that those who make laws in this land would fear God. We pray, Lord, that uh, you would do this and do it soon. Father, we pray for uh, our brother Michael and for Wendy and for uh, Josh and for Sam. We thank you for their presence amongst us. Lord, we thank you that Michael now has an opportunity to take a holiday and we pray that that would be very refreshing for him. We pray, Lord, that uh, any travels that the family undertakes would be uh, done with safety and that they'll be able to, together, uh, delight in you. And they'll be able to have real recreation. And, Father, that uh, at the appointed time, Michael will return to us refreshed and recharged. Lord, in the meantime, we pray for the ministry here, uh, for those who'll be preaching. I think especially of Neil today, and we also remember uh, Josh, who's preaching at Norwood this afternoon and next week. He's due as well. And we pray for your blessing upon these men as they preach and uh, blessing upon the people as they hear them. Lord, for the Rojas family, we thank you. And we thank you for their report, a uh, glad report from Cambodia. And we pray, Lord, as uh, they seek to prepare and then go long term uh, to minister to those who they call the K people. Lord, that you would be going ahead of them preparing the way and that they would be able to be uh, immersed in the community there, a real beacon of light with their godly witness. And Lord, that you would use them to translate your holy word into the language of the people in that region and that the people would receive this text with joy and that it would produce a great many believers as your spirit works through what they read and what they hear preached. Father, we think of our brother Kim uh, Jager and we thank you for his tireless labours covering all those miles through the remote parts of this uh, beautiful island. We thank you for the relationships that he has. We thank you for the conversions that he's seen. We thank you for the encouragement that his ministry is to so many lonely Christians, to so many people who are seeking the truth. And we ask, Lord, that you continue to uh, make Kim that person who brings the good news. Lord, that uh, his vehicle as he drives it will echo the beautiful feet upon the mountains that bring those glad tidings. And Father, we ask that you would keep him safe on the road, keep him ever encouraged, keep him ever on the mission, we pray, of proclaiming Christ to those who so sorely need to hear of him. And Father, we think of our brothers and sisters in Vanuatu. Lord, we thank you uh, for uh, Amos and for Ian and uh, the other dear brothers and sisters from that uh, lovely island nation that we have uh, visit amongst us when they're um, working here in Tasmania. And Lord, we thank you for the funds that have been raised and we pray, Lord, that they would be uh, just what they need to have a roof to keep the, uh, the, the elements out and we pray for the congregation there at Kamastea Memorial Church. And we ask, Lord, that they would be a true Christian fellowship at all times, a place that is loving and welcoming, a place where they love each other. And we ask, Lord, that you would bless uh, the preached word there as well, that their uh, minister would be faithful. And we ask, Lord, that your spirit would work mightily to make that place a, 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 a draw card for the locals to come and hear the truth. We pray, Lord, that you'd use uh, that congregation to save many souls. Lord, we also remember the needs that we have here locally. Lord, we thank you for each person that we have here in our, in our fellowship. We ask, Lord, that you'd minister to each one in our various needs. We particularly remember those who are ill. We remember those who cannot be with us. We remember those with chronic illnesses. 
be they illnesses of the body, of the mind, the illnesses that come with ageing. Lord, we ask that your grace would be upon each one with richness. We ask, Lord, that we would love each other truly and that we'll be attentive to each other. Lord, we ask that this uh, place here at St Andrews would be a place where all are welcome to come and hear the truth and come and know the love of God that is found in Christ. Lord, continue with us now as we worship you and we ask all of these things in confidence in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to sing again, friends, uh, this time, uh, number 428 in our books, otherwise it's on the screen, which is Psalm 1. Let's stand to sing together. I could invite uh, Catherine to bring us our reading. Thank you. The 
The Bible reading this morning is Psalm 139, which is on page 618 in the Pew Bibles, or it's on the screen for you to follow. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my, discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it very well. My frame is not hidden from you, when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there are none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. O oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God! O men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? Do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me to the way everlasting. May God add his blessing to this reading from his word. Good day, everyone. Good to see you here. Uh, for those who haven't sort of who don't see me very often, my name is Neil Cameron. I actually do quite a bit of preaching at different churches. Um, around the north of Tasmania. There's about 15 churches which I preach at on a regular basis. Uh, and they are Presbyterian, Anglican, Uniting, and uh, just recently I've been preaching at a Baptist church. In fact, next Sunday I'm preaching at Sheffield Baptist. There we go. Well, everything, everywhere, all at once. That's the title of a Hollywood film that was released, that was released in 2022. It's a very profitable film, but the critics loved it as well. The plot of the film is based on this premise that a multiverse exists. That is, that our universe is simply one of many, which means that there are versions of us in these different universes. Um, and there's also different history going on in these universes. So there's a, there's a universe when, where Tasmania has become the capital of the world. Uh, there's a world in which Tasmania doesn't exist. Um, and there's a world where the only difference is that the road out there is just five centimetres closer. Now, this is, of course, speculation. It hasn't been proven. Science says oh, it could be true. But, of course, all we need is for uh, the that sort of speculation for books and TV series and films to come out. Now, while it's entertaining and thought-provoking to examine the potential possibilities of our universe, it's also important that we examine the characteristics of the creator of this universe. And this is what we see in Psalm 139. Now, Psalm 139 is one of the better-known, uh, more popular passages of the Bible, and it's considered great 
because it gives so much information about who God is uh, and, and what he wants us to do. Uh, when Christian theologians get together to discuss the nature of God, uh, Psalm 139 is one of the Bible passages that gets looked at. Okay, let's start looking at, uh, by looking at verses 1 to 6. Let me just read it again. It says, To the choir master, a psalm of David, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Now, what's being described here is what theologians call omniscience. This is the idea that God knows everything. So omni means all, science means knowledge. God has all knowledge. And by everything, yes, the important events of history, but also events that aren't uh, terribly important at all. David starts off by saying, Lord, you've searched me and known me. So God knows David. But what does he know about David? Verse 2, you know when I sit down and rise up. So God knows when David sits down in a chair and when he gets up out of the chair. I mean, that, that sort of information is pretty useless. We might think it's pretty incidental. What's the point of God knowing when David sits and stands? Well, the point is that God is so great that he can even discern those things, even the most minor things in, in our world God knows about. He continues and says, "'You discern my thoughts from afar.'" So God can not only see uh, what David does physically, he can see into David's mind. He can read David's thoughts. Now, when you think of King David and his life, God would have known all, of, all those thoughts, how David may have come up with a new song, a new psalm. Uh, there were times where he was battling King Saul, so God could see into his mind all that. Uh, he, God was there in his mind as David spied upon the woman having a bath next door. And, he, and David may have got up out of bed one morning and had a bad back. God knew about that as well. Uh, so all of David's thoughts were open to God to read and to understand. Verse 3, you search out my path and my lying down. Now this is a reference to David's plans for his life. Literally, it can be about knowing the path through, say, a garden that he's going to walk through. But it's also about the plans that he has for his life. So it's about the, the big plans, about where you're heading. It's also about the small plans, you know, which, which um, path you're going to walk down. It doesn't matter. Both are true. Continues on. David says that God is acquainted with all my ways. So God knows about David's choices. He knows why David uh, says and does things. And that God can see through any attempt by David to put a mask up or stop someone from reading his intentions. Verse 4, even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it together. That's how great God is. God knows exactly what David is going to say before he says it. Verse 5, you hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Now, this verse shows that David is in God's hands. Uh, to be hemmed in behind and before sort of gives this idea of a, like a farm animal caught in a pen. He can only go forward. He can't go back. It's, uh, he's, the animal is being forced to go one way. That's the sort of idea that's going, that's going on here, that David's uh, direction has been determined by God. God makes it impossible for some things to happen to David's life. Verse 6 says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Now, this is the idea that as David contemplates uh, God's omniscience, he says it's like looking at something that is way too high, it's like looking up to a tall mountain or upon the clouds or upon the moon and stars. He realises, as he begins to, to partially understand uh, the omniscience of God, that he only knows a small part of who God is. And as he contemplates the nature of God, he realises that that knowledge is just too high, too distant for him to attain. 
Now let's move on to verses 7 to 12. Verse 7. Where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is br as bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. Now, while verses 1 to 6 focus on God's omniscience, the fact that God knows everything, these verses concentrate on what's called his omnipresence, which is that God is everywhere, omnipresent, all present, all everywhere, okay? Verse 7, where shall I go to flee from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? Uh, now, whether David's talking about God as spirit here or whether he's talking about the Holy Spirit doesn't really matter. Uh, when he asks the question, where shall I go from your spirit? The answer is nowhere. Where shall I flee from your presence? Nowhere. God is everywhere. And he gives some examples. Verse 8, if I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. Now, Sheol is an Old Testament word to refer to the grave. It's also used in reference to uh, hell or Hades. Um, I think what David's doing here is he's actually comparing like height. So it's like the grave that, that, you, that, that doesn't matter how low you go, doesn't matter how high you, are, you go, God is there. Verse 9, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. Now, I want you to imagine now that you're standing on the shore of the Mediterranean Sea, where Israel is, okay? So if you've got the map of Israel in your mind, you're standing on that shore, you're facing west, because that's, that's where the Mediterranean Sea is. Behind you is Israel, which is the east, and so the sun rises from behind you. And as the sun rises, the rays go flying out to the sea, off into the distance, and so um, the idea here is that you can go, it doesn't matter how far you go, on the, the wings of the morning, the, the speed that you go at, uh, whether you are dwelling in those parts of the sea, it doesn't matter, God is there. Verse 10, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. So even though he may be far away from Israel, way off in the distance, underneath the ocean, it doesn't matter, God is still there leading David and protecting David. Verse 11 um, and 12 say, uh, if I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, the darkness is as light with you. Now that, that, that series of those two verses may seem a little bit confusing. Um, it's actually quite simple. It's saying that God can see in the dark. Uh, it, it says, you know, people may have thought about the gods and they can say, well, during the day, God can see me, but at night there's no more light, therefore God can't see me. David says, no, he can see you just as well as at night as he, as he sees you in the day. Now let's move on to verses 13 to 16. You formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. So now, after contemplating what's outside of him, he now contemplates himself. And he realises that it is God who formed him. It is God who knitted him together in his mother's womb. And he praises God for he is fearfully and wonderfully made. He sees the creation of a human being in the mother's womb as being incredible. And yet while the unborn child grows inside the mother, shielded from the eyes of everyone until it comes out, David says that God can see that child in the womb. And then he mentions something incredible. Verse 16, in your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. 
So just as the creation of a child is amazing in the present, David goes further into the life of that child. Uh, he, he looks at the steps that this child would have gone in his life. Uh, in his case, this unborn child uh, was eventually born and he ended up um, you know, growing up to be a shepherd and then defeating Goliath and then turning into a warrior, or a musician, a king. He saw that God had a plan for him in life, even when he was growing in the womb. And inferred from this, you could also say that maybe he saw his own end as well. He saw as, the, as he saw the steps in his life as he was a child, he also would have seen that one day his steps would end. And yet those were preordained. He pauses in verses 17 to 18. He marvels at who God is. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I'm still with you. Now what David again is doing here, he is marvelling at who God is and he's also expressing his own inability to completely understand or comprehend it. As he says before, this knowledge of God is too high. He can see some of God. He can see enough of God to marvel at what is there, but recognises his own limitations. You know, if I count them, they are more than the sand. Okay, it's, uh, it, he's saying, God is, when you, when you bring your thoughts to, to, to consider God, after a, after a very short time, your thoughts realise, I can't fully comprehend all of this. Now, in verses 19 to 22, David changes. Uh, when you are, for example, if you're a Christian and you begin to study philosophy, or if you, if you believe in, in a God and, and study philosophy, and you think, okay, God is, is everywhere and he knows everything, um, and of course there are passages which say uh, that, um, that God has all power, you naturally begin to ask, why is it that bad things happen? God knows everything. God is everywhere. He is all-powerful. What happens to, these, to, to the evil? What happens? Why is there evil in the world? And this is actually what David goes on to talk about here in verse 19 to 22. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. O men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? Do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. It's pretty serious stuff, isn't it? David wants the wicked dead. He wants God to judge those who've murdered and killed other people. And he wants God to judge those who've taken his name in vain. And if God is angry at these people, then obviously David is as well. And then if we finally move on to verses 23 to 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there's any grievous way in me. And lead me to the way everlasting. And so David ends the psalm with a bookend, going back to the beginning. If you've ever had a Pink Floyd album from the 1970s, you'd know that the, the ending goes, to, goes straight back to the beginning again with the same sort of music. And so what he's doing is he starts off with the phrase, search me, O God, and know my heart, and he finishes with the same phrase. Now David's being either incredibly arrogant or very humble when he does this. When he says to the Lord, search me, O God, and know my heart. Because if he has sin in his heart, God knows it's there. And so he's being arrogant. He's saying, look at me, God, I'm sinless. Look at me, I haven't done anything wrong. Alternatively, David might be saying this because he knows that God will see sin in his heart. And so when he's saying it, he's saying it in humility. Now, in the end, it doesn't really matter which way it goes because David finishes with the plea, lead me in the way everlasting. In other words, he is, uh, he is, he is uh, asking God to be his guide for the future. Okay, so that's how the passage sort of fits together. 
What does this passage teach us about God? Well, God here is referred to in two different ways in this passage. He is called God, which is the Hebrew word Elohim, and he's also called by his name, Yahweh, those capital letters for for Lord that you see there. Those are the times when God's name, Yahweh, is mentioned. And you've got to remember what he says in Deuteronomy 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. So he's saying Yahweh is Elohim. Obviously, God is omniscient. We see this in this passage. He teaches us that God knows everything. He knows all the important things. He knows all the unimportant things. God knows who killed Kennedy. He knows what uh, toothpaste you used this morning. Now, while this passage is from King David's point of view, it doesn't mean that God doesn't know what's going on elsewhere. He knows about this for everyone. This means that God knows us. He knows, uh, we see here that God knows our weaknesses. God knows our sin. He knows the pain that we have caused others through our sin. And he also knows the pain that we've gone through from the sin of others. Also, we see here that God, uh, it teaches us that God is everywhere. There is no place that we can go to hide from God. We can, we can stand on Mount Everest and God is there. We can, uh, we can get into one of those submarines that don't implode and we can go all the way down to Challenger Deep near the Mariana Trench to the, to the absolute bottom of the depths of the planet and God is there as well. The furthest from Earth anyone has ever been were the, uh, the three astronauts on the Apollo 13 mission. You remember the Apollo 13 mission, how early on, and as they were travelling to the moon, there was an explosion. They, there was no way they were going to make it to, to a moon landing. So they had to adjust their orbit. They had to adjust the, where they were going and what speed they were going in order to come straight back to Earth. And as a result, that as they swung around the moon, they were the furthest that anyone has ever gone. And it was uh, about 400,000 kilometres. And yet, God is there as well. Now, the thing about discerning God's presence, have you ever felt that God is distant? Have you ever felt that God is far away from you? Um, A lot of people feel that way, but you've got to understand it doesn't matter what you feel, God is not far away from you. He is right there, right now. So when you feel that God is far away, that's just your feelings. God is right there, right now. He knows everything that's going on with you. God knows us as an individual. Just like David, we can't hide anything from God. God knows everything that we do. God knows whether you are a true believer or whether you're just uh, pretending. He knows our motivations He knows our hypocrisies. Now, when we pray to God, you have to understand that he sees right through us, which means we can't be anything but honest with God. So as you pray, you can't, you know, if there's something that you don't want to talk to God about, God knows that it's there. You can't lie to God. He knows it's there. He knows our fears. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our pain. He knows our anxieties. He knows our limitations. But while God can know us completely, we can only know a small part of who God is. As David says, it is high. I can't attain it. We can know God's will for our lives in terms of obedience to his word, but we don't know exactly the the bits and pieces of, of his sovereign will that he's planned for us which means that we have to trust that what God is doing, uh, that, what, that God is, has got a plan for our world, and he has also got a plan for us within it. But he doesn't promise to reveal everything about that plan. Now, what does this passage teach us about the gospel? Well, the important thing to look at here are the wicked. When David turns his address to the wicked, in verses 19 to 22, who is he referring to? In one sense, he's speaking out against murderers and killers who have shed blood. But we see there's a wider definition. In verse 20, it says, They speak against you with malicious intent. They take your name in vain. 
the broader picture of the New Testament, however, shows us that sin is a problem afflicting all of mankind. All mankind is sinful. All mankind is born with sin. Now that phrase, search me and know me, I talked about it, was it? It was arrogance or humility. Um, Either he's boasting in his greatness to God, saying, you know, see if there's any grievous way within me, or else he's being humble. Now, we Christians can say what David says here, and we can say these words as well. Search me and know me, see if there's any grievous way in me. And we can say that with confidence. Since we are sinners, we are unrighteous. And so when we say, search me and know me, see if there's any grievous way in me, then we are humbly submitting to God's omniscience, acknowledging before him that, yes, we are sinners. And yet, at the same time, we can say these words to God, we can say, search me and know me, see if there is any grievous way in me, and we can know that God does not see anything grievous in us. Now, is this possible? Am I talking here about someone being perfect, someone being sinless? Sort of. When God looks upon one of his children, a Christian, he does not see anything grievous in him. He does not see the sin that is in the Christian. And this is because when we became a Christian, the righteousness of Christ, his perfection, his sinless life was transferred to us. So when God looks at Jesus, he sees our sin. When he looks at us, he sees Christ's righteousness. In theological circles, this is called imputed righteousness it's found all the way through the new testament Uh, in second corinthians chapter 5 he says this for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of god see how that's swapped there we have our sin which takes us away from god we have christ who is perfect and when he dies on the cross that's switched over So that when God looks at Jesus, he sees our sin and he is punished. And when God looks at us, he sees Christ's righteousness and therefore we have been forgiven. Now what about that idea about forgiveness? Because there's a few few verses here which don't really seem to, to, to look very good for forgiveness, do they? Verse 22. I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Now compare this to what Jesus says on the cross in Luke 23. He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So which is it? Should sin be punished or should sins be forgiven? Is is Christ correct and David wrong or is David right and Christ wrong? Is it I hate them with complete hatred or is it Father, forgive them? The answer to this is simple and yet profound. It is both. Sin should be both punished and forgiven. In order for sin to be addressed by God, then those who sin must be judged. And the wages of sin is death. But when Jesus dies on the cross, he did so in our place. God punishing Jesus in our place. So God's forgiveness is granted to us through the death of Christ for our sins. And so Jesus took upon himself our sinfulness. And through his death and through his resurrection, God places upon us the righteousness and perfection of Jesus. So there's really two ways to live here. Either we can take God's punishment for our sin on our own selves or else we can accept God's offer of repentance and forgiveness. So we turn to him in faith, trusting in Jesus as as our saviour, trusting that Jesus takes away our sin, repenting of our sin before God, begging him for forgiveness. Now, if you've yet to come before God and to ask him forgiveness, God is calling upon you now to do so. 
When you've done this, you can, you can then ask God. You can, you can buy, be by yourself with God and you can say to God, search me and know my heart. And you could do so in full confidence, knowing that God does not see your sin, but rather sees the perfection and righteousness of his son. Now, a few things here about uh, what this passage teaches us about the Christian life. Uh, the passage, uh, this passage is often used by those who oppose abortion, and rightly so. It shows that a, a baby in the womb is a human being. Now, I won't go on to this, into this, this area too much. You can chat with me afterwards. But uh, the idea, one reason why uh, we see abortion as a great sin is because we see the unborn as being a human being. The other, uh, one other thing that, that, that affects us here is our private life. If I, as I pointed out, God, has, God is omniscient. He is omnipresent. He sees what you're doing. This includes your private life, honouring God in the way that you live. And so God knows if you're stealing from someone. God knows if you're planning to harm another person. God knows if you're, if you're fudging your taxes. God knows this. So don't do these things. We need to trust in God, even when our paths are unclear. Now, this is a hard one, because some of us have had very clear paths in life where we've gone down and everything's turned out right, but there are many people out there for whom that hasn't happened. And we have to allow this uncertainty in our lives and accept it as part of God's overall plan, which is difficult, I know. And if we don't, suffer uncertainty or pain if, if everything has worked out for us then we need to we should praise the lord for that and we should also uh, also act to support those who are not as fortunate now of course the great philosophical question of how god can allow evil even though he is all-knowing all present all powerful is this god will one day punish evil this is the judgment day to come when Jesus returns. Now, God does allow some evil to be punished in this life, but we can't believe that all evil will be punished in this life. This means that there are people out there who are, who are great sinners, who've used their position of power uh, to hurt many people, and um, they may end up leading a quite happy life. And we have to accept this fact. We also have to accept the fact that God calls on us to forgive those who've sinned against us, even though it's difficult and hard to do. But we do this in the knowledge that sin that has been committed against us will be paid for at the end, either through the punishment of the unbeliever or of Christ taking that sin upon himself. Let me conclude. God knows everything. God is everywhere. He is the creator of everything, including us. And yet God cannot be fully comprehended. We, we can see part of him, but not fully. And while evil may exist in our world, one day God will remove it. Until then, we should come to God, to God in prayer, in transparency, repenting of our sins and of our shortcomings and trusting God to lead us in ways everlasting. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, you are too big for us to comprehend. You are too vast for us to measure. You are everywhere and you know everything. Give us the desire to love and obey you throughout our entire life, even those, others, those areas where others can't see but you do. Give us assurance of our faith that we can know that Christ's righteousness has been imputed to us and give us joy throughout our whole lives as we submit to your service and love one another. Amen. Thank, thank you, Neil. Um, in response, we're going to stand and sing together, Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me.
please stay around if you can for a cup of tea and coffee. Our final blessing comes from the words of Paul to the Corinthians. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.